The Scarlett 2i2 is a classic audio interface featuring two XLR inputs on the back, two line inputs on the front, headphone output for monitoring, as well as a studio monitor output on the back. And at $199, it's an affordable entry point for somebody looking to get into audio production or podcasting or even YouTube. I've had great success so far for the past eight months and just a few minor nits, but more on those later. I mainly use the Scarlett 2i2 for just this, recording A-roll audio for YouTube. Here's my thoughts as well as a quick roundup of all of the features that it has. It's nice that this device has all of the physical hardware controls on the device that you need to get going. You don't need to install any software in order to use this, it's effectively plug and play. Starting from left to right on the front of the device, you have your channels one and two, and the select button selects which channel you are controlling with the knobs on the front. You can even link the channels in stereo mode and the knobs will adjust the gain accordingly for both channels at the same time linked together. You do that by holding the select button. Now guess what the 48 volt button does? That's right, it's for phantom power. Unfortunately, here's one gripe that I have is the phantom power goes into both of the XLR inputs on the back, so you can't just select channel one or two and send phantom power to one or the other, it comes to both. So you do have to be a little bit careful if you have equipment that may get damaged if you send phantom power to it. That's just something to note. INST is the instrument button. If you're hooking something up to the line inputs on the front, like a guitar or a keyboard, you would use the instrument button. Then you have auto. One of the great things about the Scarlett 2i2 is that it features auto gain. You push this, you talk into the microphone how you would or play the instrument how you would when you're performing. It'll go through a short routine. You'll see the countdown go around the dial in blue. And when it ends, it automatically sets the gain level based on the input that you had selected. I found it sometimes sets this a little bit lower than I would like, but it's you know, definitely on the safe side, it'll avoid clipping in all likely scenarios for you. But that's a pretty useful feature for beginners. Then you have the clip safe button. Turning clip safe on will automatically monitor your recording and acts just like that, a limiter if you get too loud. It'll automatically turn down the recording to avoid peaking. And the air button adds a little bit of that special sauce. So one press of the air button, it turns green. They call that presence mode. Now presence mode lifts the high frequencies and makes the recordings sound a little bit more bright. If you push it again, the air button turns orange. They call this presence and drive. And it's kind of like a classic EQ. Now it does add some high order harmonics above a thousand hertz that you don't get with the green mode, but it's effectively raising the low frequencies giving a little bit of boost to the bass, scoops out the mids around a thousand hertz, and then does a similar processing to the highs to brighten up whatever you're recording like the green air mode does. Right now I'm recording without any air mode. This is an example with the green air mode, which is just presence. You might be able to tell a little bit of brightness. And here's what it sounds like with presence and drive. I definitely noticed the bass come through in my voice more with this. And I usually actually use this with the Shure SM58 when I'm recording for YouTube, so it might sound familiar to you. The output rotary knob is the volume level if you have studio monitors connected. That'll control how loud they are. Then next onto the headphone jack, of course, that's a volume knob control for the headphones and you get a direct monitoring button that gives you a few different options for monitoring the audio out of both inputs at the same time. You can either set it so both come through, or you can set channel one through the left side, channel two through the right side of your headphones, you know, personal preference, but good to have options there on the monitoring front. I've found the headphone jack to be of ample quality. There's been some complaints online, but this device has given me no issues, and I really do like the way that the direct monitoring sounds out of this device. Spinning around to the back of the device, you get two regular old XLR inputs, not combo jacks, since the line ins are on the front. You have your monitor outputs, as well as two USB-C ports. The first one connects the device to your computer, transfers power and data, 
And the second one is an auxiliary power that you can hook up with a power brick. If you happen to not be getting enough power out of your computer, you can add some auxiliary power to the device to make sure it functions properly. Now here's the second sort of gripe I had with this is the first time I sat down to re record a podcast, I thought, well, I've got two microphones hooked up, the gain's set a little bit above 50, this thing's outputting quite a bit of power, I gotta just be safe and plug in the device into auxiliary power. And when you do that, I could audibly hear a very high frequency that unfortunately made its way into the recording and was a real pain to get out. I had to separate both channels of the audio and effectively mute one when the one person was talking, mute the other when the other person was talking, took a few high pass filters and a few other tricks and it didn't totally go away and added a little bit of extra work to my post-processing, more than I would have liked to do. So that's kind of an annoyance and just something to be aware of based on my experience. Now this leads me to my final dislike and that is that there is no mute button. And this really isn't a podcasting interface, right? It's an audio interface first. Something like the Rodecaster does have a little bit more features at over double the price, which is how I ended up with the Scarlet anyways. But it's a minor nit. My office isn't sound treated and when we record in here, there's definitely some crosstalk between the microphones that comes through in the final recording. Part of that is setting audio levels properly. The other part would be sound treating the office. It would be nice to be able to mute one mic or the other when uh, we're not both talking on the podcast to avoid that step in post-processing. So there you have it. Eight months in, I use this for almost every video that I make for YouTube. And if you're looking to make the switch to XLR, I definitely think the Scarlet is worth looking at. Some of the cheaper options, the single input, single output ones, don't have the same preamps, uh, don't have the same quality components. So just you know, go watch your reviews on those. My experience is with the 2i2 Gen 4. It's been great for me. And I actually don't see myself upgrading to a Rodecaster anytime soon. If you enjoyed this video, stay tuned for next week where I test over 10 microphones that you can use for YouTube. Otherwise, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Later.